A very warm welcome, as always, to hearers of the word for the third Sunday of Advent in Year C. In the liturgical tradition, this is called Gaudete Sunday, Rejoice Sunday. And this is what comes out in the letter to the Philippians. I want you to be happy in the Lord. I repeat, I always want you to be happy. Or in a more traditional translation, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So it's a challenge for us in these difficult times to get that feeling of Christian joy, that quiet exhilaration that marks our lives as believers. The third Sunday of Advent in Year C. In the liturgical tradition, the third Sunday of Advent is known as Gaudete Sunday, that is, Rejoice Sunday, and on the Sunday a different colour candle is lit. And for this presentation we'll follow the sequence, Advent C21, the readings, the message, some conclusions and a prayer. The name Gaudete comes from the second reading for today from Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 which in translation reads, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, and in Latin, Gaudete in Domino. It corresponds more or less to a similar Sunday in Lent called Letare Sunday. And here is the map of readings for Advent in this year. As you can see on the right-hand column, we move from the end of time to John the Baptist on two Sundays, and then the story of the visitation. And for the third Sunday of Advent, we hear from Zephaniah. Isaiah 12 is used as a responsorial psalm, Philippians chapter 4 and Luke chapter 3. The reading from Philippians is quite short, and we can go straight to it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians is a letter of joy, as you can see from these couple of statistics. Joy, or cause of joy, chara, turns up in Philippians 1, 4 and 25, 2, 2, 29 and 4, 1. And the verb to rejoice or be glad, chairo, turns up in Philippians 1, 18, 2, 17 to 18 and 28, 3, 1, 4, 4 and verse 10. To rejoice with sum chairo, turns up in Philippians 2, 17 to 18. So there's no mistaking the note of joy in this letter, and in particular in our reading. Last week we looked briefly at the shape of the letter, and here it is again. Possibly the speech categories are the most useful, and we find ourselves in 3.20 to 4.20, that is, the conclusion, the summing up of the letter. The conclusions of the letters of St. Paul can be very interesting. They form, as you would expect, a kind of summary, sometimes an expansion, and always an extra emotional investment. And towards the end of his letters, he often uses a style I call staccato, piled up imperatives, sometimes gathering in issues not dealt with necessarily substantially in the course of the letter itself. It may be no harm to take a quick look at the context for our reading, which begins in Philippians 3.20. And Paul writes, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we also await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his glorious body, 
by means of that power by which he is able to subject all things to himself. So then, my brothers and sisters, dear friends whom I long to see, my joy and crown, stand in the Lord in this way, my dear friends. I appeal to Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I say also to you, true companion, help them. They have struggled together in the gospel ministry, along with me and Clement and my other co-workers, whose names are written in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if something is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about these things, and what you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So an interesting couple of instructions there. Our first reading on this Sunday is taken from the prophet Zephaniah. This is a short book, only three chapters, written at a very interesting time. Josiah was king, that's 640 to 609 BC. The northern kingdom of Israel was already under Assyrian rule and the southern kingdom of Judah was about to fall under their control. The ruling classes in Jerusalem, including the priests, had compromised ahead of time with Assyrian culture and religion. Zephaniah excoriates this accommodation with his inevitable idolatry and syncretism. His great theme is the day of the Lord, a day of calamity and judgment which will lead to a purified remnant. And parts of the present text could be post-exilic. And perhaps for a moment a map might help. The map on the right gives some of the struggles of uh, Josiah with the imposing uh, Assyrian power encroaching on him. Perhaps more interesting is the map on the left, which pictures the expansion of Assyrian power, which eventually took in all of ancient Israel. The book that has come down to us as the book of the prophet Zephaniah is only three chapters and it can be mapped as follows. In verse chapter 1, verse 1, there's a title and then you have judgment, chapter 1, 2 to 6, an exhortation to silence, chapter 1, 7 to 18, an exhortation to seek the Lord, 2, 1 to 3, 7, an exhortation to wait, 3, 8 to 13, and an exhortation to rejoice, 3, 14 to 20. Our reading comes precisely from the last part of Zephaniah, and it sounds that it might just be post-exilic, a later editorial edition. In any case, here's the text. Shout for joy, daughter of Zion. Israel, shout aloud. Rejoice, exult with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has repealed your sentence. He has turned your enemy away. Yahweh is king among you, Israel. You have nothing more to fear. When that day comes, the message for Jerusalem will be, Zion, have no fear. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh, your God, is there with you, the warrior saviour. He will rejoice over you with happy song. He will renew you by his love. He will dance with shouts of joy for you on a day of festival. So a very encouraging and warm-hearted reading in spite of the military language. The note of joy that we can detect in the reading has been picked up by Pope Francis and he himself is a great promoter of Christian joy and joy in believing 
and he writes as follows. Perhaps the most exciting invitation is that of the prophet Zephaniah, who presents God with his people in the midst of a celebration overflowing with the joy of salvation. I find it thrilling to reread this text. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives you the victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. By way of variation, the responsorial psalm this time is not a psalm at all. It's a canticle taken from Isaiah chapter 12. And coming from chapter 12, originally it belonged to 1st Isaiah, that is, the 8th century BC prophet, whose works are substantially represented in chapters 1 to 39 of the present book of the prophet Isaiah. It shows the usual marks of biblical poetry, that is, parallelism and metaphors, and sometimes the metaphors are sustained, as we shall see. So here is our responsorial psalm. Look, God is my deliverer. I trust. I will trust in him and not fear. For the Lord gives me strength and protects me. He has become my deliverer. Joyfully you will draw water from the springs of deliverance. At that time you will say, Praise the Lord, ask him for help. Publicize his mighty acts among the nations. Make it known that he is unique. Sing to the Lord, for he has done magnificent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry out and shout for joy, O citizens of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel acts mightily among you. There's no mistaking the tone of energy and joy in this response to Zephaniah. And we come at last to the Gospel reading, Last Sunday we had Luke uh, 3, 1 to 6. Now we have the subsequent paragraphs, 3, 10 to 18. When all the people asked John, what must we do then? He answered, anyone who has two tunics must share with the one who has none, and anyone with something to eat must do the same. There were tax collectors too who came for baptism, and these said to him, Master, What must we do? He said to them, Exact no more than the appointed rate. Some soldiers asked him in their turn, What about us? What must we do? He said to them, No intimidation, no extortion. Be content with your pay. A feeling of expectancy had grown among the people who were beginning to wonder whether John might be the Christ. So John declared before them all, I baptise you with water, but someone is coming who is more powerful than me, and I am not fit to undo the strap of his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn in a fire that will never go out. And he proclaimed the good news to the people with many other exhortations too. As is very clear, the first part of the reading is governed by the question, what should we do from different groups? And then you have the interesting question of baptism of fire and the harvest symbolism and the expectations of a Messiah, which are registered in books outside the Bible for the most part. And it's worth noting that the expression good news comes from 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, and the, the writer doesn't hesitate to say John the Baptist preached the good news. So we can take the Gospel more or less verse by verse. So Luke 3.10 When all the people asked John, what must we do then? These questions are in Luke only, and the message is addressed to the crowds, that is, the people as such, and not just to their leaders. And a life of 
practical conversion of heart leading to real service of the neighbour is what John seems to have had in mind. Luke 3.11 He answered, Anyone who has two tunics must share with the one who has none, and anyone with something to eat must do the same. Of course, looking out for the poor is very much part of Old Testament and Jewish piety, as can be seen in Isaiah one ten to 20 and 58.6-7 and many other texts. At Luke's stage of writing in the, in the evolution of Christianity, Disciples looked forward urgently to a reversal of oppressive social conditions, as may be noticed, for example, in the Magnificat, but also in the Acts of the Apostles. Luke three twelve to 13 There were tax collectors, too, who came for baptism, and these said to him, Master, what must we do? And he said to them, exact no more than the appointed rate. As is well known, tax collectors or toll collectors were most likely fellow Jews who worked for the empire. They were regarded as traitors and were well known for corrupt practices. And verse 13 acknowledges the corrupt practices, exact no more than the appointed rate, but does not promote the abolition of the taxes, interestingly. Luke 3.14 Some soldiers asked him in their turn, What about us? What must we do? He said to them, No intimidation, no extortion, be content with your pay. So soldiers too could have included Jews in the service of Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And this teaching of John the Baptist is confirmed in the writings of Josephus, the contemporary Jewish historian. Luke 3.15 A feeling of expectancy had grown among the people who were beginning to wonder whether John might be the Christ. Some clearly did regard John the Baptist as the Messiah, and he himself seems to have been clear that he was not. However, what he did expect is not so clear. God himself, perhaps, or an angel, or the Messiah, or a Moses-type prophet. Three sixteen. So John declared before them all, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is more powerful than me, and I am not fit to undo the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, Pneumati Hagio, and fire. It might have been a good idea to translate the verb here to baptize with the more obvious literal meaning to immerse, to distinguish John's baptism from later Christian, the, Christ, the Christian sacrament. John distinguishes himself from the Messiah in three ways. The Messiah will be someone more powerful, and John uses a metaphor for the humblest task of the lowest servant on doing the strap, and there will be a different kind of immersion stroke baptism. It may well be that the original image was simpler, wind and fire to go with water. But of course the word for wind, pneuma, is also the word for spirit, and in the Christian reception of this, the word holy has been added to make John predict the coming of the Holy Spirit, a very important theme in Luke and Acts. Luke 3.17 His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn in a fire that will never go out, in Greek literally aspesto. Harvest is time to examine the quality of the crop, and so it easily becomes a metaphor for judgment throughout the Old Testament. The image comes from farming practice. The whole mixture was thrown into the air, and the wind blew the chaff aside while the grain, more substantial, landed, and the chaff was then burned. 
Of course, the fire as a harvest was not literally unquenchable. This points us really in the direction of final judgment, where the metaphor has been extended. And so we come to the last verse of this Sunday's reading, Luke 3.18. And he proclaimed the good news, euangelizito, to the people with many other exhortations too. Just interesting to note that Luke does not hesitate to use the word gospel for the preaching of John the Baptist. In fact, here, the expression, he proclaimed the good news, is actually a single verb, euangelizito, which reflects the practice in uh, 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, where the word gospel is never a noun, but always a verb. As we cast an eye over the readings for this Sunday, we notice that the first three, that's Zephaniah, Isaiah and Philippians, are actually very closely connected in terms of joy, and Luke reflects the practical consequences for everyday living of believing. So Zephaniah offers confident, joyful faith, and the so-called responsorial psalm, Isaiah 12, preaches renewed trust in God and again the proclamation of joy. Philippians is full of deep joy, as we saw. And then, in response to the preaching of John the Baptist, very practical, everyday advice is given. What should we do, of course, is both obvious and pertinent. In the maelstrom of life, it is good to stand back and discern what is being asked of me in the many contexts of life, family member, spouse, parent, disciple, leader, pastor, evangelizer, and so forth, at this particular moment in my life? In these different roles, how should I be? What should I do so as to enable others too to fulfill their own callings as family member, spouse, and so forth? As in the teaching of John the Baptist, Our responses are authentic only if they are practical, down-to-earth and real. So quite a challenge from the Gospel, actually. And so we pray. God of all joy, you delight in each one of us, and we thank you from our hearts for your great love. May the joy of believing in you help us to be bearers of your truly good news in our world today. Grant this through him whose coming is certain, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. I hope you were able to enjoy that piece of music at the end and attempt to copy the tone of today's readings, inviting us to deep and quiet Christian joy. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching this short video.